So for frappy number two, we're given a table of values. We're also told that f is twice differentiable, which just means we can differentiate twice. Um, this might be important if they bring up the intermediate value theorem or the mean value theorem, because we know for those that it has to be continuous, and then for the mean value theorem, it has to be differentiable as well. Um, continuity might be something that comes into play, I don't know, but it's basically saying that we're allowed to do things with this <laughs> since it's twice differentiable. There's nothing weird happening here. Okay, so our first question asks us to approximate f prime of 4, which we know that f prime of 4 is asking us for the instantaneous slope when x is 4, and we're not given a value there, and really, even if we were given a value, it wouldn't be the slope, um, but we can use the values that are closest to it to approximate the slope. So if we find the slope between 5 and 3, we're going to get a slope of negative 3, and that is as close as we can get with this information for the instantaneous slope at 4. For part B, they ask us to find this definite integral, which seems a little weird, but it's not really that bad. Um, we do want to go ahead and separate the 3 and then this negative 5 f prime of x. I think that'll be a little bit easier to see. So when we're integrating just 3, we're going to get 3x, and then I'll have to find the definite integral here in a minute. Um, with this negative 5 f prime, I'm going to go ahead and put the negative 5 outside because it's just a coefficient. And then taking the integral of f prime should just give me f of x. So that brings me to the definite integral part of this. So remember that you're plugging in the upper bound and then subtracting, plugging in the lower bound. So I'm going to have that 39 minus 6. And then same thing over here, plugging in 13, subtracting, plugging in 2. But then I'm going to have to use my table just to see that f of 13, looking at your table up here, is 6. And then f of 2 is 1. So plugging in both of those values, so my 6 and my 1. And then from there, we're just simplifying until we get that that integral is 8. For part C, we're told to approximate the integral from 2 to 13 of f of x using a left Riemann sum. So this is not something that you would necessarily need to draw. You could just use your table here. Just every time you're imagining the rectangle in between two points, make sure you're choosing the y value on the left. But I did want to give us a little bit of idea of what we're looking at here to just kind of remind us what Riemann sums are talking about. Uh, first, notice on these that the x value distances are irregular. So that means that each one of these rectangles is going to have a different width to them. Um, but for that first rectangle in between 2 and 3, remember if we've got a left Riemann sum, we're choosing the height on the left. So since 2 was at 1 and then 3 is at 4, I'm going to choose the 2, 1 for my height. And then in between 3 and 5, choosing my height on the left. Between 5 and 8, choosing my height on the left, so that one's actually underneath. For 8, choosing my height on the left, sorry, 8 to 13, choosing my height on the left. So if we're looking at our areas here, we've got one with a width of 1 times a height of 1. We've got a width of 2 times a height of 4. We've got a width of 3 times a height of negative 2. So that's where that negative area is going to come from. And then for the last one, a width of 5 times a height of 3. Okay, so adding all those together, all of our little areas, um, we're going to end up with 18. Um, but again, I didn't necessarily need to draw this. I could just look at my table and say, okay, for that first rectangle, a width of 1, and then I'm using the height on the right, so times 1. In between 3 and 5, a width of 2, using my height on the left. 5 and 8, a width of 3, and then using my height on the left. 8 and 13, a width of 5, using my height on the left. So it can be done pretty easily with right or left. Um, Riemann sums when you're given a table like that without drawing it, but just to give us a little idea here.
Then part D is the most complicated of these four parts, but it's really not as complicated as it sounds. So they tell us in the beginning of part D that f prime of 5 is 3, so we have the instantaneous slope for f of 5. Um, but then they also tell us that f double prime of x is less than 0, and this is really the biggest part of this because it's going to give us a little bit of context for why we're able to answer this using tangent and secant lines. So my f double prime of x being less than 0, remember that if your second derivative is less than 0, that means that your graph is concave down. Okay, so if we're looking at this graph, and this is going to be using the values from 5 to 8, and we're really going to be talking about 7 more than anything else, but from 5 to 8 it says that it's concave down. So I'm just going to give us an extreme example of being concave down. Um, so one important thing about it being concave down here is that any tangent line, so we're going to be talking specifically about 5, but any tangent line along this 5 to 8, since it's concave down, it is going to be above f of x. So that means that if we use the tangent line to approximate in a minute f of 7, that our approximation is going to be above f of 7's actual value. The other thing that we're going to be looking at is same reason, since we're concave down, the line that is secant here in between 5 and 8, which just means that it goes through the curve twice instead of just touching at that one point, if we are going through 5 and 8, it is going to be an under approximation of f of 7, um, because again, if it's concave down, then a line going through two points on either side of 7 is going to be below the actual f of 7. Which brings us to actually using the tangent and secant to over approximate and under approximate f of 7. So first that tangent at x equals 5, using the fact that they told us f prime of 5 is 3, so that tells us the slope is 3, and then using our table we know that f of 5 is negative 2. So just using that we can write an equation for that line. Okay, so remember we're talking about this tangent line here that is an over approximation for anything in this range, 5 to 8. So if I'm plugging in 6 into this line, it's going to be above the actual f of 6. Okay, so our explanation, we're going to say, first of all, that since that f double prime is less than 0, we know that it's concave down, and any tangent line is going to have to be above f of x for that 5 to 8. That's what that means for us since it's concave down. So if we use our tangent equation here for um, x at 5 and plug in our 7, it should be an over approximation. So when I plug in 7, I get out 4. And then we can see that 4 has to be an over approximation for f of 7. Or in the words that they used, f of 7 is it has to be less than or equal to 4. The other part of this is using the secant between 5 and 8. So since we're looking at a line that's not tangent, it's secant. So if we're looking at this line right here, first I'm going to actually have to find the slope between 5 and 8. So using my table, I can use my values for f of 8 and f of 5 to find the slope between them as 5 thirds. And then either using f of 5 or f of 8, it really doesn't matter, but I used f of 5. I can write the equation for that line. And then same thing, I'm going to plug 7 into this, and this should be an under approximation for f of 7. So I kind of ran out of room here, but I just said similarly that secant line on 5 to 8 would lie below f of x. So kind of giving that reasoning for 5 to 8. So if we plug that in, we get 4 thirds. It is an underestimate for f of 7. And then if I had a little bit of room left, I would have just said so f of 7 is greater than or equal to 4 thirds. So just finishing it out with what they were actually wanting me to prove.